So this is not a statement. I'll play it again. As soon as it got dark last night, we really, we started falling apart. We knew it wasn't going to come to an end. And now we're going on 24 hours and still nothing. So it hasn't even been 24 hours and they know it won't come to an end. That is a giant red flag. If the allegations against Stefan Stearns are true, then he is a monster. But does that mean he killed his girlfriend's daughter, Madeline Soto? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. In today's video, we'll analyze an interview Stefan Stern gave shortly after Madeline Soto was reported missing to determine if he was involved in her murder. At the end of the video, I will also leave you with some food for thought about this case and the remarkably similar case of Sebastian Rogers. The other thing we'll do in this video is analyze Stefan as a psychopath so that we don't get fooled. If you've seen my Summer Well series, you've seen me do this before. If you haven't, I think it's very valuable. All right, the first question is if I can get your first and last name and spell them both out for me. Stefan Stearns, S-T-E-P-H-A-N, S-T-E-R-N-S. All right, so Stefan, you seem very emotional right now. Explain to us. I dropped her off. Everything looked fine when I drove away. It's the last time we saw her. This clip right here, the opening seconds of the interview are the reason I decided to analyze Stefan as a psychopath and not as a typical subject. And the reason is his body and face, facial language are very convincing. He looks like the father who's missing a child, right? His eyes are glassy, he's crying, he's sullen, his shoulders are sloped. He's very convincingly portraying someone who's missing their daughter, an innocent father. However, in fact, he's so convincing that the interviewer himself remarks upon it. It's the first thing he says, you look very emotional. However, when the interview asks him to elaborate on his emotions, he says nothing. Instead, he talks about the day, right? He gets straight into his story about what happened. In other words, he looks emotional, but even when prompted to talk about emotions, he doesn't do it. And this is typical of psychopaths. So in my list of four tells of a bold psychopath, I have convincing body and facial language, but even in their bold stories, they lack emotion and relationship details. So as convincing as psychopaths are at acting and faking, it's still difficult for them to write the script of their story as a normal person would, to use the correct words, because they don't feel emotions like you and me. So even though I'm not a clinician and I cannot diagnose um, Stephen Stearns or Candace Wells or Don Wells or anyone, I find that these tells, for me at least, are predictive. In other words, I don't need to update this list for every new person. If I follow these lists, depending on the type of person I'm dealing with, and I detect that they have psychopathic traits, I'm more likely to catch them in a lie because I know how to deal with them. In other words, someone like Stephen Stearns, he's very convincing with his face and his body language, but I'm going to listen very closely to his stories. Does he omit the emotions in his stories that you or I would mention? And that's how you catch a psychopath in a lie. One of the most difficult things to do. And it's extremely difficult because body language people and facial analysis people can't do it. They get fooled all the time by manipulators, by psychopathic manipulators. What were the conversations that y'all had in the car when you dropped her off? Not much. She was asleep for most of the way. Told her, have a good day at school when she got out. I love her. She said, thanks. Love you too. That was it. Another interesting thing here is Stephen meets the criteria of a hoaxer. In other words, his story doesn't sound true. And now in hindsight, now that we know what's happened with him, we know 99% that probably is not true. So how can you tell that looking forward? For example, his... Uh, Girlfriend, Jennifer Soto, has not been arrested yet, but I am convinced that she has guilty knowledge. And time will tell if my analysis is correct. 
Stephen does lots of the same things that she does. So hoaxers do four things when they're telling a story. Hoaxers are conclusive about what happened. So they only tell a story when they're trying to push a narrative. That's the definition of a hoax. It's a fake story that someone wants you to believe. So they're conclusive about what happened. They don't allow for the possibility of anything happening because they want you to believe one particular narrative. Second, they are vague. In particular, they're vague about the money shot for the story. In a missing child case, the money shot is the around the time when the kid went missing. If someone's lying um, and they actually are guilty of killing the kid or getting rid of them, that's the part they're going to lie about. Everything else could be 100% true. So the money shot is what we need to pay particular attention to. If it's vague, that's unexpected. The actual parents of missing children, and we've analyzed some on the channel, rack their brains about those last moments. What did they say? Did they mention they were meeting someone? What did they look like? Were they jittery? Were they looking at their phone? Where exactly did I drop them off? Was it near a bus stop? Did I see someone sitting at that bus stop, some stranger? In other words, real parents of missing children are not vague at all about the money shot. Third, hoaxers are reticent about the money shot. So they, the information has to be dragged out of them. And like I said, when I was analyzing Jen Soto, it sounded like she was talking to CPS. It sounded like she was talking to Child Protective Services. Every bit of information had to be dragged out of her. And then we have the distinction between displayed and reported emotions. So hoaxers, just like psychopaths, are good at acting. They can overact because they know they're lying. They know they need to sell the story. So they might present a bunch of fake evidence, like a fake ransom note like I believe the Ramses did, or they might cry or weep or shout on camera, but they don't report those emotions when they're talking about it because they haven't thought to include those emotions. For example, when we analyzed uh, Jennifer Soto, they asked her, did you search for your daughter? And she said, well, you know, if anyone wants to search for her, I'm, I'm open to, I'm down to help. That's not what you would expect, right? She can look all eager to help now, but she's telling us she didn't go out and search herself. That's not to be expected. That doesn't add up. Actual parents of missing children don't need anyone else to prompt them to go search. And so where, where, where do you think she could possibly be? I mean, this isn't, as I was told, this isn't normal behavior. This is not normal behavior. She's not the type that would just run off. We don't know where she can be. We don't know where she could be. What is this? It's reticence. You don't have any idea where she could be? What What are her friends' names? Could she be at a friend's house? Did she threaten to run away? No possibilities. In other words, extreme reticence. He is of no help at all to us. Whereas if you look at the mother of Michael Monkey Vaughn or the biological mother of Gannon Stouch, you'll see that they throw out any possibility. Because all possibilities are on the table because they don't actually know what happened. So even if they just have a best guess, they typically provide the best guess. They don't just say, I got no idea. I have no clue. Another person who said, I have no clue is Casey Anthony. We're scared. We just want her home. Are you, in a sense, blaming yourself? It's hard not to. Why? I dropped her off early. I could have waited longer. She looked okay. She was walking towards the school when I saw her. It was like any other day, so I went on with my day. So notice a lack of details. She slept most of the way, so now he doesn't have to report a conversation. But she was sleeping most of the way. Okay, well, that means she was awake for part of the trip, at least. What did she say then? We don't get any details like that. I dropped her off. Where exactly did you drop her off? Was it near an ATM? Maybe she, she got caught on camera. Everything is vague, which is typical of a made-up story. So why do hoaxers make up vague stories? There's two reasons. 
The first reason is they don't want to give details that they can be pinned down to. So if he says, I dropped her off on the corner of 3rd Street and, and Cherry. Well, if there's a camera on 3rd Street and Cherry at that intersection, the police can go verify that. And liars know this. So they keep it vague. That way, they can't be pinned down to anything that can be verified. And the second reason, most common reason, is they don't think of those details in the first place. So, for example, I saw someone comment on X about another interview that Jen and uh, Jennifer Soto did where she hesitated to say what Madeline had for breakfast on the morning she disappeared. Why would Jennifer refuse to answer or hesitate to answer such a seemingly benign question? Probably because the idea of coming up with that detail never occurred to her and Stephen when they were orchestrating their story. And that's one reason why asking unanticipated questions is such a great way to catch a liar. And in my Jennifer Soto video, I said that I'll show you guys four ways to trip up liars. And you can use these four ways to trip up a normal liar, like I think Jennifer Soto is, as well as a psychopath. In other words, an extremely sophisticated liar like Stephen Stearns. So I'll go over those in a minute here. Let's keep watching. It's hard not to play myself. What has the conversation been with Jen since? <sighs> She's been very, a lot stronger than me. She's been holding it together really well. And, uh, but it just keeps coming in waves. This reality keeps hitting. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's safe. <sighs> so look at the tear wipe. Now, most people, this tugs on their heartstrings. If you didn't know any better about this guy, how vile he was, you could be fooled. Most people are fooled by parents like this. I've had lots of comments on the parents I analyze of people saying, DD, how could you pile more um, pain onto these parents? Don't you see they're grieving? How dare you? And that's why we ignore body language, especially when we detect that someone might be a psychopath, whether it's a bold psychopath or a calculating psychopath. And you can find these checklists in the DD forum, forum.deceptiondeck.com. So we ignore that and instead we focus on the words and the checklists. And I've put a bunch of my checklists here in the forum as well. So this tear wipe here, if you didn't know any better about this guy, could fool you. We're just scared. We just want to home. Have you, like, literally put boots on the ground, went out? Yeah, I even went out with the cops uh, where I had dropped her off. I even went out with the cops. Once again, displayed emotion versus reported emotion. I'm crying. I'm weeping over my missing girl. Did you actually go out and search for her? Yeah. Only when the cops made me go out, them, out there and show them where I dropped her off. So notice the, the difference between what he's showing us and what he's actually done. He's telling us he wasn't running up and down that street for days looking for her or shouting her name or with the window down going up and down at night or knocking on neighbor's houses asking if she was there. When asked if he had boots on the ground, just like Jennifer Soto, it's only when someone else prompted them to do it. He didn't say, for example, I asked the police to go out there with me. I went down to the station, I grabbed an officer and I asked them to help me look for clues. He said, even, right? So I even went out there with the police. Well, what else did you do? And we looked all up and down the road, all along the communities, and there was nothing helpful. None of the cameras were pointing the street. Nothing, which in 2024 was surprising. The church across the street had some cameras, and they mentioned seeing her waiting around in the parking lot for a while before moving on, and that was it. But it was grainy. It was grainy footage and not much, not much else. Right, the conclusiveness. Well, that was it. It was a grainy footage, so there you go. Instead of any curiosity about what it showed, if it was actually her, if there were any other cameras, if she was hanging around there, were there any other people with a cell phone? The lack of curiosity is what always stands out with hoaxers. 
because they're pushing a story. They're not, they are not actually curious what happened. They know what happened. In my opinion, he killed uh, Madeline, or it was at least accessory if Jennifer did it, but they both know what happened. They both have guilty knowledge. It seems like she walked west, east. Uh, they said in the direction of the school. I'm not sure what that is. What was the language? Not language verbally, language, body language. When you dropped her off, did she seem happy? Was happy. she like, I'm going to meet she my friends? Happy. She had a happy weekend. She just turned 13. She had a 13th birthday party. She was happy that we were all together here. And she's just very happy. She was a happy kid. She's very sweet. She's a she was a happy kid. So he's speaking about her in the past tense. Remember, at this point in the in the uh, case, when this interview was done, they didn't know what happened to her. For all they know, she she was going to pop up at the door any minute. So here he seems to have slipped up. She was a happy kid. And this slip up is so big that it is actually in the deception deck. So I'll read you that rule. And then I'll also read you the card for how to trip up a liar and catch an uncooperative liar. So if you're not familiar, the deception deck is my 52 favorite rules for spotting lies and manipulation. And first I'll read you this rule about past tense. We just saw she was a happy kid. Murderers often refer to their victims in the past tense, reflecting their knowledge of the victim's death. If a suspect describes a missing person using past tense, it could indicate that the suspect is the killer. So each card has the rule. They're flashcards, so you can practice and learn them so you can spot lies on the fly, just like I did right here. So he spoke about Madeline in the past tense. It could indicate he's the killer. I personally believe he's the killer. And the example I give on the card, I give a real world example on each card, is the Susan Smith case. Where she said that her kids wanted her and they needed her, and later it was revealed that she actually locked her kids in the car and drowned them. Okay, so here's the... We've seen this interview ask Stephen Stern some fairly good questions, right? Like, what direction did she walk in? What was her body language like? But if I could advise him on what to ask Stephen Stearns, or in the case of Sebastian Rogers, a similar case that's going on right now, where these parents are actually going onto YouTubers' channels and doing interviews, um, this is an open message to them. So if you have uh, a true crime channel or you know one of these channels that actually got the opportunity to interview them and might get another opportunity, please tag them or send this to them or clip this and send it to them. All right, so this is in my deck, uncooperative subjects. The more emotion they feel, the less command they have of language. Hercule Poirot, right? one of the best fictional detectives. And here's the four ways to trip up a non-cooperative subject. When dealing with uncooperative subjects, a key tactic is to increase their cognitive load. The stress of lying combined with this increased mental demand can significantly disrupt a liar's thought process. So you want them thinking harder. Effective techniques include, one, surprise, asking unexpected questions that someone fabricating a story is unlikely to have anticipated. Kind of like the question of, what did Madeline have for breakfast that morning? If they crafted their story about dropping off, that's what they focused on. They probably didn't think about going further back in time and making up what she ate for breakfast, which is why Jen probably hesitated to answer that, because she probably thought to herself, well, if I say Madeline skipped breakfast, and Stephen in another interview says that she he made her pancakes, it shows that we're lying. Right? So surprise questions. Two, detailed questions. So probing for intricate details that are often omitted in a fabricated narrative. As I said in the Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Soto uh, video and this one, asking where exactly they dropped Madeline off would be a good question because it's detailed. That way you pin them down to something that can actually be verified. Three, reversal. Requesting the subject to recount their story in reverse chronological order. 
So you ask them to say, okay, start from when you dropped her off. And then tell me what happened before that. And what happened before that. And what happened before that. By getting them to tell it in reverse chronological order, they have to work harder. So if it's a made-up story, it's more likely they will trip up and mess up. And you'll be able to spot more contradictions from the first time they told the story to the second time they told the story to them telling it in reverse. And fourth, speed. Demanding quick responses and imposing penalties for hesitation. These methods can effectively unbalance a deceitful individual, revealing potential inconsistencies in their account. And the fourth one, you might not always be able to punish the person you're interviewing, right? You have to have some sort of authority, like be their employer or be law enforcement um, or a parent. But basically saying, if you take more than three seconds to answer my next question, I'm going to think you're guilty and you're, you're going to be in trouble. Right, so putting on that adds extra pressure. A, because they know that a penalty might come, and B, because they have to lie quickly. When you combine all those, it makes it very difficult, even for psychopaths, to lie. She's a very sweet girl. She brings a lot of joy to us, and we just... not knowing... So the unknown is killing you. Yeah, it's like our whole world is upside down. I'm not feeling her presence here is... I'm sorry. It's hard. I'm gonna be fine. Don't you need to apologize. Um, what do you... Saying sorry is also another thing that guilty people often do, which is a form of leakage. So not necessarily saying sorry because they feel bad about what they did, but they know they're guilty and the word sorry just slips out, right? So it's not even conscious. That might be what's going on here. Casey Anthony is another person who did that. Another person who I also think is a psychopath. When she was on the phone with 911, uh, she couldn't hear what the operator was saying allegedly, right? According to the recording. And so Casey said, sorry, instead of something like pardon or huh, or I can't hear you. The word sorry came out. It could be totally benign, but it could also be a leakage. Guilty people often find a way to apologize indirectly. So sorry just comes out. Could be what just happened right there. What do you want our viewers to know when they see some when they see this? She's a sweetheart. She's a very sweet, kind girl. Just please be nice to her. Bring her home if you find her. Tell her that we love her. Wherever she is, I hope she's okay. I mean, if you find her, tell her, blah, blah, blah. So this is actually part of my checklist on parents of missing children, what they should do or what we expect them to do and what I observe that actual parents of missing children do when they get an opportunity to be on TV or on YouTube or basically get their message out there. They do certain things. So whenever you're analyzing something like this or Stephen Rogers where the parents are appearing, look for these things. Look for them to speak about the kid in the present tense. We just saw Stephen Stearns speak about her in the past tense. It was just one slip up, but typically we don't expect them to slip up at all like that. It should always be in present tense because they don't know whether or not their kid is dead or alive and they default to alive. Second, we expect them to be cooperative. So we expect them to answer questions fully and candidly. Third, we expect them to be inconclusive. So we expect them to be giving out any possibility of what their kid, where their kid might be. Not, well, we, we don't know, no clue. Maybe she was kidnapped. Done. That reticence is not to be expected. We expect them to address any potential kidnappers because they don't know whether or not the kid was kidnapped. And Stephen Semi did that there, where he says, if you find her, um, tell her we love her or something like that, or bring her back to us. But that also sounds like someone who might have, might he, like he's picturing someone stumbling across her body, not necessarily a kidnapper. To a kidnapper, I'd expect them to say, look, if you have my daughter, we will pay you. Just drop her off at a police station. We won't pursue you. Um, just please bring her home. She's 
you know, she's my little girl. Fifth, we expect them to address the child through the camera. As far as he's supposed to know, he doesn't know whether or not she's alive or held captive somewhere. Or she just ran away from home because she's angry and she's uh, Googling herself and finding this video on YouTube. He didn't address her directly. He didn't seem to even address a kidnapper directly. He didn't make an offer of a ransom. In reality, it sounded like he was addressing a potential person who's out walking their dog and stumbles across her body and calls the police and returns her, her body to them. In other words, he might be actually picturing her dead body and the person who's likely to find her because he knows that she's dead out in a park somewhere. Instead of like an actual parent of a missing child who doesn't know, could she be watching? Possibly. Could a kidnapper have her? Possibly. So I should talk to both of them. Sixth, we expect them to ask for help. Help me find my daughter. And then seventh, we usually expect them to have a call to action. Because they've spoken with the police, or even if they haven't, they know that my entire point of appearing here isn't to make me look innocent or to build up my alibi. My entire point of appearing on this show is to get people to help. So they typically don't require any prompting to ask people to help. If you see her, she looks like this. Uh, here's a description of her. She replies to Maddie or Madeline. Uh, you know, call this special help number or call 911. I mean, if someone were to come in contact with her and you gave me her diagnoses, would it be easy to approach her without any, like, agitation or anything? Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's a good kid. She's a good kid. If you can sum up in one complete sentence, Right, so once again, not a cooperative response. I would expect him to be assuring people, look, um, she just has ADD or ADHD. She's a normal little kid. You can go up to her. Please just call her name. She's not going to do anything to you. She's a sweet child. He just says she's a good kid. Doesn't address diagnosis. And more importantly, doesn't do anything to try to reassure people who, based on that question, might be scared about approaching her to reassure them that, yes, she is safe to approach sentence waking up getting ready to drop her off at school dropping her off at school to now speaking to me after talking to the police about her being missing for over 24 hours right now and one complete sentence what would that be a living nightmare it's a living nightmare day started off like any other and you know, i just want to wake up <laughs> You just get hit with waves of the reality just setting in. As soon as it got dark last night, we really, we started falling apart. We knew it wasn't going to come to an end. We knew it wasn't going to come to an end. How would you know that? Remember, she's only been missing for like a day or something at this point. Why would you have no hope of her coming home, especially when it gets dark? It's the end of the day. It's cold out. If she skips school, she should be coming home now. When he says this, it sounds, it reminds me of OJ Simpson when he says, well, I'll keep searching for the real killer for the rest of my life. Well, how do you not, how do you know the real killer will not appear while you're still alive or how it will take the rest of your life? Um, John Ramsey did the same thing. I will keep searching uh, till like my final day to find the person who killed my daughter. How do you know it will take uh, until your death to find the real killer? They're leaking that they know what happened. Whereas the father of, um, of Natalie Holloway said something completely different. He said, I'll search until we get justice. Right, so putting no time limit on it, the justice could come tomorrow, it could come in a year, it could come in five years, it might come in a phone call within five minutes because he doesn't know. So this is not a statement, I'll play it again. As soon as it got dark last night, we really, we started falling apart. We knew it wasn't going to come to an end. But now we're going on 24 hours and still nothing. So it hasn't even been 24 hours and they know it won't come to an end. That is a giant red flag.
conflicting reports here and there. People say they see this or that. None of it's conclusive and none of it's helpful. How would he know none of it is helpful? A grainy photo could still be confirmed to be her or a video camera. So this is where people slip up. They speak too, conclusive, too conclusively for what they should actually know. We just want also, you might think, well, hey, DD, you're digging too deep into his, his words, right? All he said was it's not helpful. How does he know that, right? So any bit of information could or could not be helpful. You or I, if we were in this situation, we wouldn't know whether or not it's helpful. If someone posted a grainy photo that could be Madeline online, I wouldn't know whether or not it's helpful and neither would you, right? Because we don't actually know if it's her or not. So he is speaking out of turn here. It is a red flag. As um, minute as it might seem. So a baby girl back. Tom, any questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to wrap up with this uh, note here. To definitely drop your comments on this video in the DD forum. As you can see here, many members have posted their insights into the case, and lots of them are excellent. So even though I don't have time to cover every single case we come across, in the forum we are covering other cases, including, for example, Sebastian Rogers or the Princess Kate situation, um, etc. All right, so here's some food for thought regarding that Sebastian Rogers case. Since he did not win my members poll that I posted, so there, there doesn't seem to be enough interest in his case for me to do an entire video or series on it. And I don't think that's because my audience doesn't care about him. I think it's more because there is so much good content about him and so many good people analyzing his case and seeking justice for him, including two of my favorites, Pat Brown and Peter Hyatt are doing lots of videos on him. So in the thread here on the DD forum, I just posted my two cents, what I want to add to the conversation since I'm not going to do a full-blown statement analysis about his case at this point. And you can take this information and apply it to Madeline Soto as well as Stephen Rogers and lots of other similar cases. So here's my two cents about that case. Sebastian was a stepson and this single fact increases his his risk of abuse by his stepfather by 40 times. In other words, before you even listen to a word of the parents, statistically just be aware that if the kid is the stepchild, or in the case of Madeline Soto, right, the daughter of Stephen's uh, girlfriend, the risk of abuse is far higher than with biological parents. And it doesn't mean that every step parent is immediately suspect and, and guilty, but you should keep it at the back of your mind. Right. So on the channel, we don't just do statement analysis. We also use critical thinking, um, logic, as well as statistics about how the real world actually works. The other thing to note is uh, Sebastian was disabled. He had a disability. I think he was severely autistic. And we also heard in this interview that Madeline had some sort of a disability. I think she has like ADHD. Unfortunately, disabled children are at a three times higher risk of abuse than children without disabilities. So when you combine a disabled child or a child with a disability and a stepfather in the picture, or step parents, or in the case of William Turrell, who I've analyzed on the channel, two foster parents, you really need to pay attention to what they say. Because statistically, you're looking at a much more dangerous situation than the alternative. Now, we can't make a final conclusion on based on all that, but it is something to factor into your analysis and the way you think about the case and how closely you pay attention to certain things. All right, so let me know what you thought of this video. Until next time, stay true.